and continuing to grow in my career is really important, as I'm sure it is for a lot of people. Are you a PA or an NP who would really love to kind of step out of the clinical realm and do something different? You don't know what that would be or how you go about doing that. Are you thinking that you're a clinician, that's all you know how to do, and how do you prepare to do these other jobs? Well, my guest today is a PA who has transitioned from clinical medicine and stepping into the world of business and tech startups and consulting. And she's gonna walk us through changing our mindset and understanding our skill sets and how we can apply them in the business world. So if that sounds interesting to you, then stay tuned. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Amy Story. I have been a PA for, gosh, 12 years now. Currently, I am what you call a clinician generalist. Talk to us about how you started doing this and what you started doing. So yeah, I w was in direct uh, patient care for almost seven years. I was definitely feeling burned out. Over time, I felt like, I just don't feel like I'm helping as many people as I want to. And also you're seeing a lot of patients in a short amount of time. And I was really feeling that disconnect between really wanting to help and serve people, but feeling like you're really serving a system, right? A system of healthcare. The other thing was I was a new mom. I was so sleep deprived. I was trying to, I was breastfeeding at the time. So I was trying to pump around patients and I was, I was exhausted. So like asking myself, gosh, do I see this being sustainable knowing that I wanted to have more kids? And that was a really big question. And then I think third for me as a person, you know, growth and continuing to grow in my career is really important as I'm sure it is for a lot of people. And at the time for me, there, there really was only like two paths that I saw people going toward and it was academia or hospital administration. And I really wasn't interested in either. And so I think the question that I kept landing on was, do I see myself doing the same thing in 10 years? And the honest answer for me was no. And so then I had to figure out, okay, well, then what? <laughs> So tell us a little bit about some of those things that you started doing once you stepped yeah, out of the clinical world. Absolutely. And I'll also tell you how I stepped out of the clinical world because yeah. it's it's probably a word that no one likes to hear, but networking is really important to find other opportunities. I think that's something we don't often learn in school is the value of a network. Even if you're directly in clinical care, always try to network with people who are outside of it. I think the pharma reps that come into your office are really good for this because they know a lot of people. And this was the first person I went to, to start talking about, Hey, I'm feeling really burned out. I'm feeling like I want to grow and try something new. What do you think I could, here's what I'm thinking. Like, do you think like this is possible? And so I talked to one of my good friends in the pharma industry who had a big network and he said, I know the exact person to connect you to. And he did. And so what he did was he connected me to this person who was part of a consulting company. Now they were employed by one of the local payer systems where I lived at the time. And they were, their whole job was to go into primary care practices, um, independent ones who were really transitioning from more of a fee for service world to a more value-based care world where they were trying to take on more risk um, patients, so had multiple chronic conditions, and were really trying to manage them better to keep them um, out of the hospital and not utilizing the system as much. And then they were going to be getting incentives from the payer system to help do that. And so the payer system employed this consulting group to, to help primary care practices more from the operation standpoint to build programs like chronic care management to really help support them. And so I talked to this person at the consulting practice. They were looking for a clinical transformation advisor to help um, from the clinical lens. And it, it was interesting because they were looking for an RN. That was what the job posting said, you know, wanted to have an, a person with an RN experience who had worked in primary care. I actually had none of those things, not an RN, and I hadn't worked in primary care. So when I went into the, to the office, just to like a meet and greet, I was really able to sit down and say, Hey, like the things that they were looking for were no different than, you know, what I had done. I got the clinical, 
clinical experience, just like an RN has. They were really just looking for someone who had clinical knowledge, who could speak to the clinical team, right? I think that's a really important skill when you've been a clinician. Clinician speak is really important. They were looking for someone who had primary care experience, but we are trained as PAs, we're trained generally. And so I was able to speak to my training and say, I know these things. I know about diabetes. I know about hypertension. I know like what it could look like to build a program to like make sure you're meeting measures for these patients. And so I was able to really translate, you know, not only my clinical experience as a PA, how it could be useful, but how I could really help them too. So I landed that job and, um, and that was really my first, you know, foray into, hey, there's this other world where I can use my what I describe as using my traditional clinical skills in non-traditional ways. And so really what I mean by that is, you know, the job itself was, it was building programs and using a lot of project management skills, which, you know, we do as clinicians. I think that's actually a really fundamental skill that we have. Because if you think about, you know, you're seeing a patient and you're managing them through a problem, right? You are communicating to them. You're also managing steps along the way. You are, you know, understanding what's in and out of scope. A lot of that is project management. What I mean by that is if you're a specialist or you're not a specialist, if you're a primary care, what's out of your scope? Okay, then get them to a specialist. If you're a specialist, what's back to the primary care? And so you're managing scope. Um, you're managing stakeholders, which means you're communicating to other parties of the clinical team, as well as the patient and maybe their family. And so I drew from that, um, from my experience, just managing patients, transition into, hey, let me run this project. Okay, I kind of know those fundamental skills of keeping on track with things and communicating. Um, and so that was, that's transferable, right? But I got to like expand that skill a little bit more. So we ran projects um, for practices. We built chronic care management programs. So I got to learn a little bit more about even what that is even from like the billing standpoint, which how do you, how do you bill for chronic care management um, and things like that. We um, implemented uh, population health. Um, so we implemented a tool to look at predictive analytics for, for a population of patients who were, who had chronic disease. And so I kind of got to learn that terminology as well. And so, yeah, that was like my first experience of like, hey, cool, I've got these skills. I can still use them just a little bit differently. There's a lot of skills that we have as clinicians that we've developed that we don't understand transfers to business because we, we don't understand the terminology that that transfers to. Is that, do you think that's true? I absolutely think that's true. I've seen this a lot in my experiences. I've transitioned into more working with earlier stage startups. And I think this is also true there where sometimes when a startup is trying to build a solution for a clinician, they also don't know the clinical language. And so I think it works yeah. both ways, right? Where right. we need to, to, I think, open up our mind to understand, hey, when there's, yeah, when they're talking about a stakeholder, this is what it means. And oh, how, how have I actually done this in my, in my day-to-day -day job? Or thinking about like, when they're talking about sales, we actually also do that as clinicians every day. And I think, I think it's hard for us to wrap our minds around because when we think about sales, it could maybe you think about like the, the pharma rep who's coming into your office and you think, oh, that's kind of no disrespect, but like, oh, maybe that's kind of sleazy, right? right. That's not true. Sales is actually about relationships. It's about getting to like meeting people where they are and getting them to trust you so you can talk about what it is that you're trying to persuade them on. When I think about sales as you, how you use that as a clinician is thinking about vaccines, okay? Vaccines are, they're very polarized, right? Let's say you work in the peds office and you're, you know, dealing with a family who's very hesitant to vaccinate their children. You are in essence, maybe you're trying to sell them on that vaccine, right? And it's not saying, it's not using scare tactic. It's, it's not judging them. It's saying, hey, let's, talk about the the pros and cons, right? Let's talk and about educating, and educating what you know. <laughs> exactly. And, it, and that's what sale, like a role in sales is actually really about. And I think that's a really cool role. If you're thinking about non clinical opportunities, thinking about uh, like a role that maybe 
a company is selling to clinicians because they are your peers. And so when I also, when I talked about sometimes companies don't understand the language of the clinician, that's where you have a unique value proposition to say, they're my peers. I can actually talk to them in their language, but still like utilize the business needs. Right. And so that's a really wonderful translatable skill that I, I often think we, we just skirt past. But it takes a lot of patience and endurance to have that <laughs> that relationship building yeah. skill. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point that we use sales all day long, every day in our practices and, and don't even think that we're doing that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other examples of skills that we have that translate to business? Yeah, I think a really cool skill that we, I think, just naturally have as clinicians is the ability to think in systems, right? Like you know, you, you kind of see things broadly and then you narrow down. That's a valuable skill because if you're thinking about, you know, just solving problems in business or especially in earlier companies where things are very ambiguous and not defined, think about if you are someone who sees new patients, right? And they come in and they've got this really vague complaint. Let's just say they come in, you don't know anything about them. And they say, I really, I'm just not feeling great you have to start with a concept an ambiguous concept i don't feel great and you have to put structure to that concept we think about systems we think about body systems and we define we put definition to a concept and we drill it down 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 so i think that's super transferable and it's a it's a highly valuable skill when you're looking for other opportunities where you really have to delve into problem solving especially if you're you're like looking at a a really early company that just is not as defined. Maybe they're like building a product, but they don't have it all figured out. They have processes that are undefined. Um, you can really help, I think, in that situation. Processes in general, like process improvement and operations are also skills that we just naturally do, right? If you've ever worked in an EMR, which is all of us, how many times are we trying to make the EMR more efficient for us? We're learning, you know, like templates or hacks or, you know, we've got our like dot phrases or whatever, right? I mean, you're, you're putting in a process for yourself or think about you've created this system for yourself in your day so you can stay on time, so you can get your notes done on time, so you can hopefully breathe, <laughs> take a potty <laughs> break. It's a system, you're putting in a process, you're always trying to implement and improve that over time. Those are all transferable skills. I think the other thing that is highly underrated, actually two things, critical thinking. Not everyone can think critically. I think mean, medicine is built on the ability to think critically, but also pivot quickly. The other one I would say, and this may not go over well because I, I've been criticized in the past for calling PAs middle managers. Listen, not talking about like, I think PA should be in leadership. I'm not talking about like that we're always middle managers, but a lot of us are, you know, have worked in like with supervising positions, right? And so when I talk about middle management, it's the ability to communicate up and down, like and 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 around, right? So you're communicating to your your supervising physician, you're communicating down to maybe the medical assistants or whomever, and then you're communicating laterally to people on your team. That's huge in other roles. The, again, getting to the stakeholders, you're communicating up and down and around. And I think that for PAs in particular, um, that's really valuable. I think you mentioned two consulting jobs you, you've done so far. Are, are there more jobs like that you wanna talk about or do you wanna just highlight different opportunities that you think about that PAs and NPs could be moving into that they're not doing? Yeah, I can do a little bit of both. I have my own LLC uh, consulting, you know, business, and I do a few projects. And like one thing I found really good success in is working with really early, early companies in the tech space. But the the tech space is very broad, and so thinking about like a space that's like care delivery, so where they're maybe in like digital health or they're like on a telehealth platform, but they're seeing patients. What I've done for companies like that is. I've helped implement things like their EHR. They need to pick a vendor, right? And so I've worked with various different types of vendors. So I know pros and cons of some of them. And so even just being helpful from a clinician point of view, because who's using the EHR? 
it's their clinicians, right? And so using my experience to say, hey, pros and cons of this, that, or the other. And then, hey, from a clinical standpoint, here's how I can help you really implement and build out templates and train your clinicians, right? Again, like that trans translatable articulation, the language of the clinician. I know the language of the EHR, but I also know the language of the clinician. So how can I use my skills to do that? And so I've helped companies on that end um, from a consulting perspective. Other things I've done is like chat about things like chronic care management, you know, with, with companies who are looking to build programs around that using, you know, my, my experience there. I've helped a company just understand the billing codes, like what does it mean to bill, you know, this, that, and that. And so just from like that perspective, I think where clinicians could be super useful and I, I'd be on the lookout for these opportunities is there's no shortage of companies like tech companies who are looking to build solutions. What they don't often have is a network of clinicians who are willing to give them feedback. So early feedback, so a lot of times what they do is what's called user research. So they're looking for a certain type of clinician who's practicing usually because they want their experience, you know, on the front lines or like where are their pain points that they're having in their day to day that they're trying to build for. So they don't often come with a clinical network, but they want to meet clinicians and get like just uh, feedback on their product. And so I think that's a really great opportunity for PAs and NPs, right? Because we are in the weeds. We are doing this day in and day out. We're seeing patients and we know the pain points, like the back of our yeah. hands. And these right. products yeah. are, there's going to be more and more of these type products coming to the market. It's going to be flooding the market, I think, in the next couple of years because the healthcare and technology, I think, are just becoming more and more intertwined. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that's a really great tiptoe way for PAs and NPs to start like testing the waters of, hey, how could I like you use my experience and maybe get paid a little bit, right? Maybe it's not going to break the bank, but like it's something. And then at the same time, use that as your networking advantage. If you have a conversation with a tech company, put them in your network, say, hey, think of me if you are going to hire, if you want to like a contractor to help inform your product roadmap, or maybe they're looking for an advisory board and you've got 10 years experience in this subspecialty, that's lucrative. Use that to your advantage. So it's, it's you know, mutually beneficial, right? You're giving them the, the feedback that they need, but then you're setting yourself up for success to say, hey, I'm available like for other projects down the road. If you are you know, at a point in your stage of company that you need extra help like i'm the first person to ask and so like you got to sell yourself a little bit and you have to put yourself out there but i think from the consulting opportunity i think those will be for sure growing and if i can plug a little bit of what i'm trying to work on behind the scenes humans in healthcare i want to create more of these opportunities specifically for pas and nps because i think there's a lot of them that exist for other types of practitioners but i think that we we hold so much knowledge and experience that can be really useful that I really want to create more opportunities and basically be like a matchmaker for, you know, early stage companies who maybe have a smaller budget, but really want like 10 people in this space. There's other companies in this space that do. So in the meantime, you know, certainly would encourage your audience to check out. Um, there's a company called M Disrupt. They are like essentially doing this for, you know, all types of clinicians too. They're like, they, I think they coin themselves as the health experts on demand. And so I think there's potential like opportunities there, but I'm really, my specific audience would be PAs, NPs, PTs, RDs, the kind of like that care team perspective, I think is super useful. And, and so yeah. I'm hoping to build more opportunities for us. Yeah, that, that's cool. And, and I was thinking when you were saying that, that that's another reason to start dipping your toe into the water and finding these look, maybe little opportunities because there's so many things that, that you don't even know exist. This, that's not in our realm of thinking, but once you are start associating in that area, you learn more and more what those opportunities are. And then that's how you learn and grow and find other things. It's so true. You have to really increase your surface area of opportunity. And the really the only way you do that is just showing up <laughs> and putting yourself out there. You know, really game-changing opportunity for me that really kind of like, 
propelled me on the road to even starting my own consulting and all of the my clients I have met from just like this opportunity was I, I worked for a time at a company who was building communities for health tech. And so they were building like communities for founders and clinicians were there as well. And uh, people on like the, the investing side, like on the VC side. And I, I on a whim, I, I applied for the job and I ended up getting the job. And so I grew my network significantly through that. But it was me like taking a chance on myself and just saying, you know, I think I've got something to offer. Do you feel like that the salary is there to at least equal what it is that we're making as clinicians? If people are really looking long term, do you think that they should be prepared to take something less or do you think that the opportunity is there to make the same? I think it's both and like I think it could it depends on what where you're looking and how you want to transition. I definitely think there's opportunities to make within the realm of what you're making. But I think sometimes that comes with trade-offs, right? So maybe it's like you're traveling or maybe it's different benefits or maybe you do need that, you know, extra credential, right? So I think, I think there's, I think it's both and. I think if you're like looking to build a bit of a career portfolio where you're doing like a few different things, I think there's for sure opportunity to match what you're making or potentially even more, but it may not start there. And I think that's what I think that's what we have to think about when we think about money is it may not start the same, but that doesn't mean you can get it to be the same. So I can give you like a concrete example. So when I first transitioned out of clinical care and I was working with the consulting company, I took a very, very slight pay cut. It really was very minimal. But I, within the year, I, I made it back because they were like a very structured company that did, you know, raises at the end of the year and like merit raises. And so while it was a, well, it was a little bit of a cut, like I, I made up for that. And so I was willing to take that knowing that like, it probably was all going to work out um, at the end of the day. I've had other roles where it's, I've taken larger pay cuts, but it's always, it's always worked out where something like something else has come along and it's like double what like it was. And so I think, you know, it's hard because there's, no, I don't think there's a straight answer on this. And I think it really just depends on where are you at in your season of life? Can you take a pay cut temporarily with the confidence that it's going to like come back? And if you can, I think that opens up the type of opportunities that you can look at. If, if people are, clinicians are, are listening to this and they're thinking, man, yeah, I, I would like to branch out and see what I could, could get into, any steps that you would advise them to do, whether it's from evaluating their own skills or something with a resume or, or where to go, any, any advice you can give? So them? I've lived through this. And so I think the, the first thing I would really encourage people to ask themselves is, you know, get down to the why. Why are you looking to either leave, you know, medicine or to like do some other creative things or to branch out? Because I think that's going to inform your how, but you really want to understand the why. If you don't understand the why, I think you 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 start like grasping at straws and then you just get really frustrated and then it's just it's not a good experience. So set yourself up for success and do a little bit of reflecting to ask yourself, you know, what is it that I'm really searching for? You know, for me, that question, like, can I see myself doing the same thing in 10 years, a sustainability question was really big for me. The other thing for me was that I, I, I will always love medicine. I'm that diagnostician piece of me is fundamental to who I am. But for me, it was the environment. Um, I just could not function in the environment um, and system of healthcare. And so for me, it was finding environments where I could really thrive, where I just could like felt instead of like feeling like I was surviving, because I knew that like that just wasn't going to be the case for me. And so really just getting to the root cause. And then the second step I would do is absolutely write down your skills. I think we hold them in our head, but when you put them on paper, write down all of the things that you do in your day to day. 
write down all the things, the skills that you can think of, your communication, your empathy, your critical decision-making, your root cause analysis, your problem solving, write them all down. Because when you see that list, what you can start to do is pull some out as to what gives you energy. Because on that list, not everything is going to give you energy. There's going to be a lot of things that drain you. And that's really important to know because when you're thinking about opportunities, you want to strive for the ones that lift you up, that nourish your soul and that give you energy. Because if you're just going to like find another job, that's really doing the same things that you're probably looking to leave for, like, then you're not going to set yourself up for success. So write them down. Um, what I tried to do was put them in buckets also of what is task driven versus relational, because I think that sometimes we gravitate toward those things naturally um, in different roles. And I think it's important to know where you trend, what gives you energy. Are you really like a people person? Do you like those relationships? Do you like, you know, having conversations? Do you like those things? Or are you a little bit more routine, very task oriented, liking structure? That's really important to know. So do a little bit of that definition work for yourself. And then the last piece to that I would say is, in addition to writing down your skills, start to articulate them. Like, what does this actually mean? When I'm problem solving, like, what am I doing, right? Like I'm taking a concept and putting structure to it because that's going to help you start to articulate your value prop to a potential non-clinical role. This doesn't happen overnight. This is not a five minute process. It is a legitimate, like in-depth process, but I'm trying to actually um, build part of that as humans in healthcare, where I can really help you understand, like setting yourself up for setting yourself up for success, so you don't feel like you're just go, you know, searching the internet or out there on your own. You're not alone. <laughs> you're not alone. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> and I would imagine it would be helpful to start combing through job postings and really diving into what the job description says and also what they're looking for in candidates. Mm -hmm. And don't just look at it quickly, like think about each one and think about what skills you have that would, would meet that and then write it down in the way that in the business terminology. I, I think that yeah. would be helpful. So what I did was exactly that. I had my skill as a PA. Um, I had how it translated and then into the specific like bullet point that they had on the job description. And so it's basically this map, um, the skill map that you do um, where you, yeah, exactly. You match it to the, like that bullet point. Cause when you see that visually, it gives you confidence number one, but then when you're going for the interview, like you can literally speak to what you, you how it you know translates yeah. and how you articulate it. Tell people how they can find you if they want to connect with you or learn more about humans in healthcare. How do they do that? Yeah, for sure. So I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So you can find me, Amy Story. My tagline is I'm the clinician generalist who uses traditional clinical skills in non-traditional ways. So you can find me there. And then you can also find me, um, my website is humansinhealthcare.io. That will link you to not only my email, but my newsletter. And you can sign up for my newsletter on that site as well. Okay. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. If you're curious about the Humans in Healthcare newsletter and community that she mentioned, we did talk about that some more and shared some of our stories and struggles in medicine. If you're interested in watching that video, I will put it here when it's available. Thanks for watching. And as always, take care, stay sane, and I'll see you next time on The Medicine Couch. Bye.